I think people not just have a desire to be liked by others, but they also have a desire to like others. And one of the things that people like in others is integrity. Originating from deep inside the Rocky Mountains, transported through the power of the internet, and arriving inside your tiny earbuds, it's the Appraiser Coach Podcast, helping appraisers increase their efficiency, quality, and make more money. Here's the guy who makes it his life's mission to create value for real estate appraisers nationwide, your host. Razor coach, Dustin Harris. Welcome back to the program. Dustin Harris hanging out in the podcast chair. I want to talk today, well, about this gut feeling that sometimes we get when something just isn't right and how to deal with that. I want to pause here, remind you, of course, we are sponsored by Alamode Software. Alamode is the software that I've been using for my appraisals for 20 plus years, 24 years now. My dad was using it before that. They've been around for over 30 years, three decades, helping appraisers to do more with less and with less cost, by the way. Now, you're going to pay a little bit more for Alamode, but the value that you get in return is enormous. That's return on your investment. It's alamode.com or 800 Alamode. Data Master, of course, is the way that I save 30 to 60 minutes per report. Now, I've told you before, they're not in all of the areas that I cover, but the areas that I do cover, it is an amazing tool. Go to datamasterusa.com, datamasterusa.com. Finally, we are sponsored, of course, by OREP Insurance. OREP, of course, is my e and It's an E&O company that I switched to from another well-known e and company years ago. And so glad I did, not just for the insurance coverage that they give me, but also the benefits of being an E&O member are enormous. They're awesome. Check them out. Go to OREP.org. That's O-R-E-P dot org. Folks, I want to start out by telling you a true story. And you've heard me say this before. I'm going to get a little vulnerable with you today. Okay. I love the fact that, well, podcasts can be real. They, they truly can be real. They can really say it the way that people want to hear it. I don't think most people like to hear a polished version of a podcast. They like to hear that there are people out there that are just like them, having the same struggles, the same rewards, the same challenges as a human being, that the same fears and the same and the same rewards as anybody. Right. So I'm going to be very real with you today. You've probably heard me say this before, that I did not want to get into appraising. So back in the 90s, my dad had been an appraiser for years. And back in the 90s, I went to college and, well, like any college student, I needed money, right? Not just to pay my tuition, but but to live. And I started looking for a job. I was a full-time student, but I started looking for a job to be able to pay my bills. And I was quite depressed. I realized that there really was not a lot available. Most of the things that were available were very minimum wage type jobs, and that just did not appeal to me very much. Now, my dad was an appraiser and a real estate broker through the 80s, and you all know what that felt like, or at least know of what that could have felt like. Uh, Interest rates were high, uh, not a lot of refinancing going on, and let's just say he did not do very well as an appraiser. And I saw how hard my dad worked, bless his soul, and what he got in return. And I had zero desire to do that. I had zero desire to work the type of hours that I saw my dad work and to get the return that my dad seemed to get. And so I vowed to never become a real estate appraiser. Well, that changed very quickly when I got into college and realized that the alternative was to work for the man, if you will, and and not really get much in return. That didn't appeal to me. In fact, it appealed to me even less than trying to be a real estate appraiser. So I went begging, crawling back to my my daddy and said, hey, uh, remember when I said I never wanted to be a real estate appraiser? (laughs) Would you consider taking me on as a trainee? Well, bless his heart, he has a heart of gold, and he did, and he taught me many wonderful things as a mentor. But I learned some tough lessons in the first little while of doing appraisals. And one of those lessons was learned in the first three months of being an appraiser. As I reached out, by the way, I had a very unconventional, at least it would be unconventional these days. Maybe it wasn't so much in the 90s, but I was trained long distance. 
And that's just the way it was. My dad was located about two and a half, three hours away from me. And it just was not convenient for him to be by my side as I trained. I was going to college in a somewhat distant uh, town and he had a business that he ran where he lived. And consequently, I did a lot of inspections on my own. I learned by the seat of my pants and uh, for good or ill, I learned some valuable lessons through that process. He just was not by my side. And now I certainly consulted with him regularly. I was on the phone with him constantly, you know, Hey dad, how do you do this? Hey dad, how do you do that? The first phone call I made to him was, Hey dad, how do you turn on the computer? I kid you not. That was an actual phone call that I made. I had no clue. And he was a great teacher and a great mentor, but I had to learn some of these lessons by myself. And one of them was this lesson of ethics. Now I'm not going to go into all the details, but I will tell you this much in the beginning as you can imagine, because I was not, I was not just like, like some of you just kind of fit into the existing business of your mentor. I didn't have that luxury. The area that I lived in was not an area that my dad had covered in the past. And as a consequence, I had to garner and gain all of my business myself. I had to do my own marketing. I literally dressed up in a suit and tie and got resumes together and knocked on the doors of, well, not physically knocked, but walked in, okay, walked in the doors of mortgage companies and banks and anyone else that would listen to me that could potentially be my clients and customers. And it was brutal. It was tough. I mean, I, I literally went through dozens, if not over a hundred different stops, going in, talking to them trying to convince them that some lowly trainee that, that his mentor would not be walking through the property with him would give them the value that they are looking for. And it was tough folks. It, there was, it's not pretty. When I think back on that, on those days, I would not trade that again for anything in the world. That being said, I actually found some success through that process. Now this was of course, long before HVCC, long before AMCs were a big thing. Okay. Most of the business could be gained by direct lenders, direct mortgage companies. And as a consequence, I got a couple of clients. Now I still remember the names of my clients. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to share them here, but there were two companies that, that jumped on board right up front. Now I'll be honest with you. Those two companies had a little bit experience with my dad because some of the area was a little bit of a spillover. And so it took a phone call from him to say, Hey, I mean, for lack of a better term, give my, give my son a chance. Right. And they did God bless them. And they, they hired me and I did work for them. But folks, the reason I'm telling you this story is in the first couple of appraisals that I did, it became very apparent to me that there is this interesting decision that appraisers have to make. And I would suggest that if you're new to this business, that you make this decision right up front. Now, without, again, revealing confidences and going into details, let me just say this. In the very beginning, it became very apparent to me that even the most, what would seem the most scrupulous and upstanding companies out there were not so much. From the very beginning, it became very apparent to me that I had to decide what kind of appraiser I was going to be. Because what was happening is I would go out and do an appraisal for a company. And you remember the good old days. They would send over the order. It would come over fax. Please appraise this property. It was very, very simple. The engagement letters were very simple. But they always had an estimate of value on it. Always. Right? They would come over. And by the way, the statute of limitations is long past. Okay? That was 20 years ago. 24. But let's be honest. We all went through that process. And you cringe a little bit because there's an estimate of value. What do you do with that? Well, here's what happened. On several deals right up front. Now, keep in mind, here's a guy who is young. I was 21, 22 years old. Okay. I had no experience as an appraiser. I had nothing to base my, my marketing on and say, hey, take on me, take on my dad. Right. Because he wasn't going to be there. This was, this was some baby face kid that was going to show up. Now, I've always been bald, so, you know, baby face, eh, me. I still looked older than I was. But the bottom line was, here's an inexperienced appraiser that's going to go out there and do business for this company who already has, let's just face it, four or five appraisers in their back pocket that they've been working for for years. Why should they? 
Why should they send me an order? And yet they did. And here's what would happen. I'd get an order and it would say estimate of value $148,000. Okay, whatever. I'm going to appraise it for what I think it's worth, right? So I'd go out and I would do my appraisal and let's say it came in and it's very, very, very reasonable that it would be $130,000, right? So I would do the appraisal and I would turn it in and then I would get that phone call. <laughs> You've all had the phone call, right? Especially previous to HVCC, especially previous to 2008. And the phone call would go something like this. Dustin, this is John down at the mortgage company. Thank you for your speed, your efficiency on this report. Uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about this, however. Um, what's up with the value, man? I mean, I sent over the order. It's 148000 You came in at one thirty. Surely we can make this deal work. And then, of course, the sob story of these people are going to get kicked out of their house. Their PMI is too much. They can't da, 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 fill in the blank, right? You've all heard the sob stories. And here I am on the other side of the line, and this is my dilemma going on in my head. Think how many doors I've knocked trying to get business. And here it is that I have done the very best job that I think possible. And I think I've done a great appraisal. And I think that the value at 130 is supported. And here's this guy who is a decision maker at the lending company, right? Starting to, let's be honest, pressure me to come in higher. And though he may not overtly say, well, Dustin, if you don't come in at 148, I'm never going to send you another order again. It's kind of implied. And here I am in this challenging situation because I know this guy's done me a favor. I know he stuck his neck out where he didn't need to. Again, he's got four or five appraisers he's worked for for years that probably play his game. And here's this young buck that honestly, let's face it, I look back on some of my original appraisals and I cringe at how ridiculous they are, right? I cringe at, at the mistakes that were made and the, well, let's just put it this way. They're embarrassing. So here I am trying to make a name for myself, trying to build my business, knowing that it's super important that the owner or the chief loan officer at this lending institution needs to be impressed with what I have to offer. And here they are disappointed. Here he is on the phone with me saying, dude, I told you 148, you came in at 130, what gives? Now, I had to make a decision. That decision goes to the root of what I want to talk about when we get back from the break. I want to first pause and remind you about a great E&O company out there. And I've had them in my on my side for many, many years. It is OREP Insurance. Folks, there are a lot of E&O companies out there. Why would you want to go with OREP? Well, first of all, they are the best E&O company out there. Don't believe me? Do your research. Ask others. They will tell you. But second of all, there is no company out there, no E&O company out there that gives their members more benefits than does OREP. Don't believe me? Go to OREP.org, click on the benefits tab and tell me I'm wrong. Absolutely amazing what this company gives back to appraisers. If you are with any other insurance company, check out OREP today. It's OREP.org. That's OREP.org. We are sponsored by Alamode Software. Alamode is the software. I've been talking about my early years, folks, from the very, very beginning. I was using Alamode Software. I've seen so many improvements over the years, and they were good to begin with. But, folks, this is a company that is constantly improving, constantly making their product better for appraisers because, well, number one, they want to stay in business. But number two, they want to continue to be number one, which they are. Are you with Alamode? If not, check them out. Alamode.com. It's A-L-A-M-O-D-E.com or 800 Alamode. Finally, sponsored by Data Master. Data Master or Data Master, however you want to say it, is saving appraisers about 45 minutes per report. It imports the data that you choose. There's been a little bit of confusion out there. Well, I don't want a black box choosing the data for me. No, folks, that's not how it works. You choose the data. You choose the information you want in your report. All it does is enter it for you. It saves you time. It's, it's, it's efficient. Folks, if you're not using it, check it out. It is a great tool for appraisers. It's Datamaster. Go to datamasterusa.com. Again, it's datamasterusa.com. All right, folks, welcome back to the program. Dustin Harris hanging out with you in the podcast chair. We're talking about this idea of, well, moral integrity. 
this idea that you feel like something is wrong, what do you do about it? And I'm telling the story of the first three months that I was an appraiser, and I was hired by some companies who, let's be honest, they took a chance on me. Took a chance on, all right. They took, <laughs> sorry, a little awe there. They took a chance on me, and I wanted to impress them. And I cringed when I know the value is 130, and yet there's this loan officer saying, you know what, you're young, you're, in, you're inexperienced, I know better than you. We really need 148 at least and probably you know closer to 160 on this thing. What can you do about it? And I would have a conversation with them about value and have a conversation about comps and say, listen, John, I mean, the comps are there, buddy. Look at it. I mean, these are three comps in the same neighborhood, and they all sold in the last three months, and they're very similar, and this one was adjusted for this. and have this conversation. That didn't matter. They didn't want an explanation. They wanted a change. They wanted to make this loan work, and you weren't making it for them. So what do you do in that situation? Now, folks, thankfully, we're no longer in this pre-2008 world. Now, every once in a while on social media, when it comes to appraisers, they do talk about this same problem, okay? And I know it comes up, not regularly, but once in a while. It still is happening on some level. Now, it's probably not, definitely not as overt as it has been in the past, but we're not just talking about pressure for value, folks. We're talking about a lot of different things, okay? Okay. This is an example, but there are many, many examples out there in the appraisal world of situations that happen, right, on a regular basis. For example, just recently, I was in a home in Star Valley, Wyoming, and I was doing the inspection, and the realtor was with me, and we were walking through the property, and it was for FHA, and there were some outlets that were uncovered. And I said, oh, yeah, let me take a couple pictures here. Here's the deal. Uh, these are going to need to be covered and here's how you do it and blah, blah, blah. And, she's go, and she said to me, literally said to me, well, Dustin, that's really not that big of a deal, right? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. It's not a big deal. It's a, you know, 29 cents for a, a switch cover down at Ace Hardware. Go grab one, stick it on, and I'll come back and do a final inspection. We'll get this sucker done. And she said, no, no, no. I mean, it's not that big of a, do you really have to mention that? Awkward pause. <laughs> okay. And so my, my response was a very professional, listen, I totally understand why this seems silly. I understand why this seems minor. It is an FHA issue. Here's why. And, uh, you know, I get paid to report on health and safety issues for FHA. Now, she didn't push it, thankfully. But this is another another experience that happens on a regular basis. And appraisers have these situations that we run into when it comes to morals. And really any business owner, right, is going to go through Any person is going to go through this process right? So what do you do? What do you do when the spidey senses on the back of your neck kind of raise up and say, um, problem, right? You're being asked, if not overtly, at least covertly, you're being asked to do something that's not moral, not ethical, may not even be legal. What do you do in those situations? Well, I want you to remember a phrase today, okay? Here's the phrase. I don't even know where this came from, but it's it's something that, that has stuck in my mind for a very, very long time. And the phrase is this, be loyal to principles, not necessarily to people. Let me repeat that. Be loyal to principles, not necessarily to people. Now, what does that phrase mean? Well, folks, I, I have a strong desire, as I think any human being does, to be liked. I have a strong desire to to connect with people. I have a strong desire to have good relationships, right? Whether it be my wife, my kids, my friends, my family, my clients, my members of the all-star team and the dream team, whether it be complete strangers. I think inside I have a desire to, to be kind, to be nice. Call it the nice guy syndrome. Whatever you want to call it, I think we have an inert desire to be nice. And when the loan officer called me in 1996 and said, Dustin, we need 148 out of this. What's the deal? Well, I would love to say, oh, yeah, what, gee, what was I thinking? Hold on, John, I'll get right back to you with 148. <laughs> right? That would have been the easy route. But was it the right route? Of course not. Now, The rest of the story, and I'm giving you somewhat of a hypothetical story. These numbers didn't exactly work out that way, but I'll be honest with you. The guy that called me was named John. Okay, so this is a fairly true story. I didn't do it. I took a risk in adhering to principles over people. Now, 
let's just be honest. I think in the end, you're actually not even making that choice. Follow me on this. I think people not just have a desire to be liked by others, but they also have a desire to like others. And one of the things that people like in others is integrity, right? And even though it may be awkward, even though it may be uncomfortable, when people stick to their guns and they have integrity. Now, I'm not talking about stupidity. Okay, there's a difference. And I've seen appraisers do this as well. They do something wrong, and when someone calls them on it and says, hey, could you fix this problem, they dig their heels in, and they, they get their ego up, and they refuse to, to make changes that they probably should have changed, right? I know an individual very closely. Well, I'll just say this much. He's a, he's a family member who works for a very big AMC doing review work. And constantly he's saying, Dustin, you would be shocked and surprised how often individuals I can show them in black and white a use pat problem. For example, I'll call up an appraiser and say, we got a problem here. Can you help me? Let's fix this report. And instead of listening and learning and educating themselves, they feel like they're standing on principles and saying, hell no, I'm not going to change that. That's the report and take it or stick it up your rear end. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> good luck getting future work from that individual. Now, if it truly is something that you know you're right on, okay. I, I think there's a better way to say it. Right. But, but there's nothing wrong with sticking to and everything right with sticking to your principles. Now, the idea here is you're not necessarily choosing between principles and people. The quote is be loyal to principles, not necessarily to people. But notice that word necessarily, because I believe when you stick to your principles, you're actually not doing it at the cost of people or relationships. In the end, they are going to respect and honor you because of your integrity. Now, do it in a kind way. Do it in a professional way, but do it nonetheless. Now, I can proudly tell you that at least one of the two companies that I told you about in the beginning actually stayed my customer long term. Another one stayed for a very long time, but not long, long term. Okay. Eventually, to be honest with you, I had to separate myself from both of those companies because of the pressure that I felt that they were putting on me. In other words, it was me firing them and not them firing me. Appraisers, especially new appraisers. As you get into this appraising world, you will find that with any other service-based business, I shouldn't even caveat it with service-based, any business, right? You're going to deal with unscrupulous people. In the end, you've got to decide what it is that you are going to do about being able to sleep at night. Be loyal to principles, not necessarily to people. Folks, I talked briefly earlier about my all-star team. What a great group of appraisers, literally. One of the things, one of the benefits of being a part of the all-star team is to be a part of a closed secret. You won't even find it. Google it right now. All-star team, appraiser, group, you won't find it on Facebook. It is hidden. It is secret. You are invited only as a member. Folks, it is the coolest place on the internet. It really is. Daily. It is very, very rare. I don't remember the last time we have not had at least one post per day on that group. And here is a small, intimate group of appraisers who can ask any question they want, and they will not be treated with disdain. They will be treated with respect they will be treated with uh, positivity. They will be helped. You can jump on there and say, hey, I'm doing a, uh, a difficult appraisal. Uh, it's on a berm house. Any of you have experience with that? And you won't be blasted for doing something that may be outside your expertise, right? You won't hear any of that in the all-star team. Instead, you will hear, hey, I did a berm house. Here's what I did. It's an awesome place to be. It's part of the all-star team membership. $49 a month, and that's the tip of the iceberg for all of the benefits you get for being a member of the All-Star Team. Hope you'll join me, and I hope you join me next time here on the Appraiser Coach Podcast. You've been listening to the Appraiser Coach Podcast with Dustin Harris. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and post a short review on iTunes. For more in-depth insider information on how you can make more money as a real estate appraiser, visit theappraisercoach.com and sign up for the All-Star Team today. Thanks for joining us. And now, get out there and create some value.